Great, so um, good morning and welcome. Uh, especially warm welcome, as always, if it's your first time here. I uh, hope you had a good meditation next door. And, um, well, I thought today um, we'd do something fairly unusual, well, unusual for us here, or for me at least. And uh, I thought I'd just say something about, well, what it's like when you first get into Buddhism, yeah? what it's like when you actually engage with it. And I've, in a way, the best way to do that is to kind of recount your own experience somehow, yeah? So, um, I think I wanted to do this because I was listening to a very good talk by uh, a chap called Padma Vajra, who's the chairman here, he lives in the UK. And um, it was on a retreat and he was kind of I was asking people to remember, why did you actually decide to commit yourself to this? Because after a while, you kind of forget what you're doing or why you're doing something. And it, may, it got me thinking about my own, um, yeah, my own journey somehow, yeah? And always, I mean, personally, I always find it interesting listening to, well, you might not, but I find it interesting listening to people's experiences of how they actually got involved in Buddhism, yeah? And um, it's not like a big ego trip for me. It's just a kind of, it might be my life, for example, but I think it might get you thinking about your own life, perhaps. Maybe not. We'll see. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of food for thought, yeah. So um, I first came in contact with Buddhism, I would say, in my early 20s. Uh, but actually, that's not true, because I think I came in contact with Buddhism when I was born, yeah. Uh, so that's why I brought my little talisman here, this, this little blue Buddha here. Yeah? And actually, my mum bought this Buddha um, in a market in West London called Church Street, yeah. And so this Buddha was there from the beginning somehow, yeah? There's actually a really lovely picture of my mum. She'd obviously just got out of the shower. She had a towel around her head and I was about this big sitting on her lap. And it was really lovely, warm orange sunlight coming through the window. And this Buddha was on the shelf, yeah? She's looking very beautiful. So I was like, that was quite a... I found that photograph the other day. I thought, oh, it's been there from the beginning somehow, yeah? I should also say, I mean, maybe my dad watches this on the internet, but I won't go into it, but somehow, when they were breaking up, the Buddha's head came off. Just saying, yeah? It, but he got his friend, who was a sculptor, to glue the Buddha's head back on. So he's, he's, he was kind of there from the beginning, and um, yeah, anyway, so that's that. Um, but he features later in the story as well. So yeah, what led me to come to the Buddhist center in the first place? A few things. Um, yeah, just a few things, and then I'll get into my life, what my life was like when I first came along. So one thing was my grandfather died, yeah, who I was close to. Um, he died on Christmas Day in 2001. And I think that had a very strong effect on me, yeah. Um, I was with him when he died, and my dad was as well. My dad was very honorable with him. I have to say, he looked after him very, very well, very well. And yeah, it was a strange experience because he was lying there, and it was literally his last moment. So, you know, your breathing gets very, very, it's almost imperceptible when someone's dying, their breathing's kind of, are they breathing? It's not, you can't quite tell. But for me, in my experience, what happened when he actually died, it was like the kind of, um, his body just, it was almost like deflated. And this kind of weird wave, like, like a heat wave came off him. I don't know what that is. I have no idea, but that was what my experience was, yeah, when he died. So, I think that had a strong effect on me, actually, seeing that, yeah? I don't really know what it means, but I experienced it, yeah? That was one thing. Uh, another thing was, and maybe I'll get into more like what I was like in my early 20s, but I was mainly concerned with, I would say, music. Um, I don't know about fighting myself, but kind of. Uh, money and women, although unsuccessfully with women. Um, but they were my, that was my main drive, main four drives in life, yeah? And I went to visit my mum in Copenhagen, she's Danish, and I stayed with her for a few weeks. And uh, she had all these books, like these spiritual books, yeah? Um, and I would just ridicule her, like a little horrible person, yeah? Just ridiculing her books, like, oh, what are you reading this for, blah, blah, blah. And she's quite strong, she just turned to me one day and she said, listen, why don't you read one of them and then you can carry on ridiculing me afterwards instead of just ridiculing. So I was like, yeah, yeah. And there was this book called um, Conversations with God, yeah? 
And I just thought, what a load of crap. So I got this book <laughs> and like, I started reading it and it ruined my holiday. I was just like, like my, my little framework of my life kind of expanded out. And uh, I, was, I remember just sitting in the park like, oh, a bit stunned, yeah? So that was part of it. That definitely opened up some sort of perspective. I'm sure she'd be pleased to hear that. Um, yeah, so I, w I wouldn't say I was interested in things that were spiritual, but I was interested in what you might say, um, I don't know, reality, yeah? So I remember when I was in my late teens, I was very concerned about virtual reality and us sort of disappearing into some kind of virtual world, yeah? Um, I have to say it's before the matrix and before the internet. So <laughs> not like I'm some prophet, but anyway, and there was, I don't know, some of you, especially if you're English and older, there was a playwright called Dennis Potter. Does that ring a bell? Yeah, Dennis Potter. He was a fantastic playwright. Uh, he wrote play, um, um, Pennies from Heaven, Singing Detective. Anyway, it's the past. But he wrote, he wrote one, play, um, well, turned into a screenplay called Cold Lazarus, yeah, which was set way into the future. And everyone's in this virtual world, lost in their own, in their own little virtual world, yeah. And that really hit me, and there was these characters, these, these terrorists in this play, yeah, called Rons, not Ron, as in Aron, but Rons, R-O-N, yeah, which stood for reality or nothing, yeah, and that really struck me. I thought, oh, wow, i just say that. So that was, there, there was a concern in my mind somehow about not living, I think I, w I felt oppressed by trivia. I know when you're a young guy, you can get, like, super serious, like, mm, everything has to be important and existential, and I was like that, but also... I think there was a, something positive there, like a seed of like um, superficiality being oppressive. Yeah. Mm, so that was, an, that was one, another thing that led me coming to the center. Mm, I think another large part was to be free from fear, actually, and anxiety. It's an ongoing process. Um, and I just sort of had some instinctual sense that the Buddha had something to say about that, yeah? which it turns out he does. And um, also another thing that led me to the center was um, a friend of a friend sort of bullied me yeah, to go. He, I'll tell you about him in a minute, but he was like, a, he turned into some Buddhist fanatic and he just sort of bullied me into going. So <laughs> I'm grateful for him, to him, yeah. And actually another one that I thought is really important is there was actually a Buddhist center near me. I mean, that might not sound like much, but it is. There was a Buddhist center near me, 20, 20 minutes walk away. If there wasn't one there, there's no way I'd be here. So it certainly wasn't all from my side, and that's for sure. There was people doing things, and um, it was present. Good. So, yeah, the shape of my life back then, basically my life, um, I was doing music. I was, that was my, that's what I was doing. I was doing music. I was working with some very good people mainly like jungle music, drum and bass, bit of hip hop, grime, all this sort of stuff, producing, writing lyrics. That was my day-to-day -day existence, uh, my dream, yeah? And I was really going for it. So that was, that was the one side. And my social circle was either music people or kind of, I would say gang affiliated, yeah? So they were kind of street gangs. Some of them were more actual gangsters and dealers. And I just think that kind of, for me, it was a kind of familiar combination, yeah? So. Um, yeah, it's something I grew up in late, grew up with in later childhood years, and and actually it's quite a classical combination, isn't it? Music and crime. Uh, they, or no, I shouldn't say that. Certain. <laughs> no. Um, uh, how to say that? Well, you know what I mean. Clubs, yeah, clubs, gangs, all this sort of stuff. It's a normal combination, let's say it that way. Yeah. So that was my general social world. I was doing a lot of mixed martial arts at the time. I think I was, because I was with lots of dangerous people, I think I, I felt like I was living in a dangerous world. Uh, and maybe I was. So I was doing a lot of training, martial arts stuff. Um, yeah, it's not easy being, being, I think I was quite sensitive. I still am, I was quite a sensitive person in somehow in this sort of environment. And um, I think my, my, my goal was to kind of form an island, yeah, a kind of, a strong, impenetrable, impenetrable, or whatever you say it, defense shield, yeah? So um, I was really working on that. It was like a practice for me. It was like a practice how to be, quote, unquote, fearless, yeah? Which I now kind of realized I was becoming numb. So it's slightly different from being fearless. But um, 
Yeah, friends of mine, you know, like people used to drive, I had two drivers, yeah, and they used to drive me to clubs, and I'll change their names, but one of them was called John. I won't bother with the other dude, but um, like he was, he was pretty connected, so to speak. And uh, his friend, he looked like he worked in a dungeon, yeah, he's like huge, and he used to carry this fork around with him. And I'd be like, why are you carrying a fork? And he's like, well, if the police stop you, then it's just a fork. And you can do things with a fork. It's like, you can definitely do things with a fork. Uh, so that was, they were like the people I was spending time with. And um, I just thought one, one sort of incident that sort of summed up that period of my life, or that, what I was aiming for, well, I was in this pool hall with them. And it was a bit like, you know, a gangster party. You know, have you, anyone seen that Snoop Doggy Dog and Tupac video? It's great, isn't it? Yeah, anyway. So it was a gangster party, yeah? And um, this big uh, Pakistani heroin dealer was there with his like, big gold chain, yeah? And there's this Jamaican guy next to me with these girls around him. And he just came up to him, and I had my drink, and he just knocked him spark out. They had some feud anyway. The guy collapsed. And this guy, the heroin dealer, was just kicking him in the face like repeatedly. There was blood splurting out of his head. And all the girls around him ran off screaming. My friends kind of backed off. And I just stood there like someone had spilt like some water on the floor or something. And I was like totally just nothing. And I was, as I was leaving, all my friends were like, oh, he's super cool. They were like, so like, and I thought, yeah, this is working. Yeah, my friends were happy with me. They thought, yeah, he's like super cold. That used to be, a, I don't know what the slang is these days, but the slang used to be, oh, he's cold or it's cold. It was like, a, like Michael Jackson, bad, yeah? Yeah, anyway, cold meaning good. So that was, that was what I was aiming for, and I kind of was moving towards it. Mm. Yeah, so I, I'd actually damaged my neck. I was doing a lot of stuff, and I damaged my neck doing weights and training, and all the fear just came rushing back. I had like a, it was like a completely took over me in a way. And I had a few days where I just couldn't leave my flat. I didn't know what was going on. And I looked out the window and there was like an old lady at the bus stop and I was like, is it her? No, it's not her. And then there's like a few like younger guys and I wasn't scared of them. It was very confusing. It was just fear, yeah. Um, I think I bought a book on self-hypnosis at that point and that was quite interesting. But the main, the main sort of thing that happened at that point was uh, this Buddha. Yeah, the Buddha was on my shelf in my flat and... Um, I just felt like if anybody knows what's going on, the Buddha knows what's going on, yeah? It was kind of instinctive. And I also, for some reason, had a sense that um, the Buddha was fearless, which turns out to be true, apparently. One of the Buddha's epitaphs or names is the fearless one, yeah? Um, so I went to the Buddha center, yeah? It was near me. I went with a friend. And I don't know what I was like, at, what I must have been like at the time. I came, I was quite big, unbelievably, but I kind of was like, went in and I had my like Adidas tracksuit and, you know, and came in, my friend waited outside. <laughs> and um, this guy called Sachanama, his name is, yeah, I met him again five years ago. Um, he met me and all I remember from going in was him talking to the side of my head, which must to me mean I was sitting on a sofa, not looking at him. And he was talking to the side of my head, and I was like, like a bit suspicious, yeah? So uh, I, left, I left the Buddhist center. My friend was outside, and uh, he said, yeah, what was it like? And I said, yeah, it's all right. And I said, yeah, but you had this guy had a weird name. And I said, oh, I don't know, have a banana. And yeah, that's what, <laughs> totally disrespectful. Now I'm called Tara Palita. Someone called me Tara Palita the other day, <laughs> like I'm like some Mexican backup dancer or something. And like, anyway. So be careful what happens, yeah? But, um, so I, I kept going, uh, but I hid it from my friends. It was like my dirty secret. I didn't want to tell anyone that I was going to a Buddhist center. And uh, to be honest, I wasn't particularly, the whole image of Buddhism didn't appeal to me. Uh, the kind of group identity of Buddhism I found off-putting. Um, it just didn't look good, man. It was like, I was obsessed with style, yeah? And like, they were wearing like polyester trousers and like fleeces and old Crocs before they were fashionable. And I just thought, I can't be associated with these people, yeah? So I wasn't totally superficial, though, because I, ke I did keep coming back, yeah? Um, but, yeah, it was a bit not my thing, I thought. And then, yeah, then I went to a puja. Uh, don't, uh, pe people know what puja is. It's like a ritual, yeah? I went to a ritual, 
And they just invited me to a ritual. And it was like, in, everyone was sitting in two rows, yeah, like along here. And I was positioned what would have been over there on the left-hand side. And everyone's doing this ritual thing. And I thought, okay, whatever. And then this middle-aged woman got up next to me and like walked behind me and then did like a full body prostration on the floor. And I was like, okay, that's it. That's, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> this is definitely some cult business. And like, I didn't come back. I didn't come back for like three months. I thought, there's no way I'm... This, that's way too far for me, <laughs> and um, way too far. So then what happened was a good friend of mine, a very good friend of mine who I was doing music with, he's a fantastic producer, he was actually sharing a, a flat at the time with someone, I'll just call him Derek, yeah? He's not called Derek, but this other guy is called Derek. And he, was, he, he basically became like a Buddhist fanatic, yeah? He kind of, nothing wrong with shaving your hair, I have a shaved hair sometimes, but he shaved his head like in a Buddhist way, and like he had a shrine in his room, which I was like, okay, this is a bit weird, yeah? And he had like Buddhas and pictures of Sangharachita, and I was like, hmm. And he basically just bullied me, yeah? He just kind of kept pestering me to go to the center again. Uh, and in the end, I gave in just to shut him up, basically. So I'm very grateful to him, actually. That was, <laughs> it's weird how it works. Like he bullied me into going, so. So I started going to lunchtime meditations. They were very good. To be honest, I also went because there were some attractive women there and I just thought, oh, this is good. So I'll, I'll hang out here and pretend I'm like all spiritual and like, you know. And so that was, that was good. Um, well, it wasn't good, but that's what I, anyway, never mind. Mm. And I also started listening to tapes, yeah. This was before, I think it was pre-internet really, but it was almost, almost pre-CD as well. They didn't have like a lot of CDs. And there was all these tapes of Sangharachita's talks, yeah, like hundreds of them with these amazing titles like, I don't know, the higher evolution, initiation into this and that, the tantric. I was just like, ah. Oh. So I was taking all these tapes back to my flat. And uh, it was a bit like falling in love, I think, you know. It was like, um, I'll get into it in a minute, but where I was living was rather strange. A lot of my friends were upstairs. They were all selling drugs. It was like a madhouse. Like we were having clubs. There was a lot of guns. Right? It was kind of a bizarre place, yeah. But I was listening to these tapes in that environment. I'd put candles on, draw my curtains, <laughs> lie on the floor, <laughs> lie in the bath, like this bubble bath, and just be like, oh. It was just amazing. It was like, oh, it was so amazing. You know, he was the, talking about um, art, for example, like the religion of art. He had a um, thing he wrote about the religion of art where he kind of identified where, um, uh, what was alive in this culture spiritually. Yeah? He said it's not organized religion, not communism. It's actually art. Like art, there's a lot of artists that, or on it, and I was just, and it was, he's so, I mean, he says it in a much better way than I just did, but it was, it was really, really inspiring to find those threads of energy and uh, culture that I could really lock into. It's like an education, also his emphasis on friendship, yeah, I found that very, very inspiring, yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I had a lot of, strangely, that period, I had a lot of big dreams, I'm not going to bore you with my dreams, but for some reason yesterday, I, I remembered one of them, which was I, was, I was on this train, this train track, yeah? And it was like, the train track just went on forever into the distance, yeah? And was, went on forever behind me. And I got dropped off on this station with like two little houses in the middle of nowhere, just totally flat landscape. And I went into this one house and this little ca cabin thing, which was totally blacked out and it was totally dark in there. And it was just tons of candles and this shrine in there. And it was almost like a, like a portal. I thought, oh, that's interesting. I was thinking about that yesterday. I must have had some experience from coming to the Buddhist center that, okay, you've got these tracks that just keep going, like the wheel, it just doesn't stop. But if you kind of go, go off somewhere, you can get off somewhere into somewhere where there's a different dimension of reality and experience, yeah? So that, that struck me, yeah. Um, another thing that kept going on during that period as well was I began to meditate in my flat, yeah? And a lot of times I'd have this really strange experience. I'd be sitting in a chair like this and it was like I had this big, well, this big black fish in my stomach thrashing around covered in like crude oil, like, like oil. And I'd literally be retching in meditation, like, <laughs> like half expecting some kind of this crude oil black sludge to be coming out of my mouth. And it didn't, yeah? Uh, but that would have been pretty weird, but yeah, I think it was like a purification thing. I think when you start getting involved, it, sometimes you are involved in certain things that just have an effect on you that you're not really aware of. And there is a process of um, 
purification, you know, that it's a kind of, actually, it's a traditional thing. Like in Buddhism, you have the threefold path, ethics, meditation, wisdom. And in a way, most people like myself, you start with uh, meditation and wisdom, yeah? But actually, the way we really need to be starting is ethics, yeah? That's like the baseline. Ethics is like the bedrock. You need to kind of get yourself in a shape to meditate in the first place. Otherwise, all that happens is you just get a very strong sense of your own, what you've been up to, yeah? And what I was up to, uh, well, not particularly me, but the, the block I was in, like I say, was a bit of a madhouse, yeah? So most, I think I'd say like 90% of my friends upstairs were from like Jamaican families. There was one, there was a couple of white guys. Uh, it was a mainly Jamaican area. Um, I was great, in a way it was great. It was a lively block, yeah? Um, but it got a bit mad, yeah? There was a lot of kind of um, drugs, a lot of club stuff going on, um, baseline music. Uh, and guns were floating around as well, yeah. So it was it was a bit it was a bit crazy. Um, so that was the that was the kind of context. Uh, and then Derek, the Buddhist fanatic, he moved into a men's community, yeah. So he invited me for dinner in this men's community, and I just thought this is very weird, yeah. A men's community, like what is that? Um, so I thought, yeah, I'll go. I better not scare all the little Buddhists, you know. I kind of went in. You know, like, and um, it was weird. <laughs> it was pretty weird. Like, I had some kind of awkward conversations with people around the dinner table, and I just thought, yeah, okay. And then, but then I heard these, it was a bit like, you know, my memory, I heard these footsteps coming down the stairs. And I was like, all oh, right. And this guy came in who, I mean, Cabler, his name is, yeah? And he was quite big at the time, like, physically big, yeah? Um, but, and he just sat down in front of me like, yeah, and he did, he did look a bit like a bank robber or something, or like Tony Soprano, he's just like, and he's just like looking into my soul, yeah, and, uh, but he had weight, he did have weight, it wasn't just like physical weight, he had weight of like spiritual weight, I would say, and weight of character, and he was just there, boom, and, um, in a way, he was the most appropriate person I could have met at that point in my life, and in a certain sense, I owe him, not, well, I owe him a lot, yeah? And uh, he scared me a bit, and that's why it was appropriate. He was, like, looking at me, yeah? But he was friendly as well, which was really confusing. I was like, <laughs> this is weird. And, and then he'd started, like, do you want to go for a walk sometime? And I was like, <laughs> all right, let's go for a walk. I was, like, super on guard, yeah? And basically, he just reached out to me in a, with a hand of friendship, yeah? And we just went on all these walks, and he was... It was like an education, yeah? and you, I think he was the first person in my life that I could be 100% open with and honest with, yeah? Almost from the get-go, like, it was strange. No judgment, yeah? No judgment from him at all. I could tell him anything, yeah? For example, I, well, I won't, but I, had, I remember having this weird, inappropriate sex dream. You know the kind of inappropriate dreams humans can have, yeah? And I wouldn't tell anyone about it before, but I told him. And he was like, yeah, yeah, the other day I had this dream where I was holding this baby and I bit its head off and I was drinking its blood. <laughs> and there's like this police car circling around me, like blacked out. And I was like, all right, this is, this is, I felt super cool. I was like, this is great. I like this guy. And, um, but also other weird stuff. Like I'd say to him, like I had feelings like I wished, sometimes wish my granddad was dead. Yeah. And I loved him dearly. So I was very confused. I was like, why did I, because it was like, a, I felt like his pressure on me or, or something. Yeah. And he would just take that and be like, yeah, yeah, I had the same thing with my dad. And it was like, oh, wow. It was like really amazing to just be able to be, he was unshockable, yeah? Someone you could just talk to, very much his own person, not phased, not prudish, not kind of, I would say not, he didn't have this narrow morality, yeah? conventional morality. He had a kind of understanding, yeah? And he was very kind to me, took his time, yeah? Uh, but he was also very direct. So for example, um, uh, there was a certain point where I had no money, like I was completely broke. And he, w he was doing this um, contracting in this house in the countryside, yeah, like building and stuff. So he invited me to come and I came. It's not exactly my dream, yeah. I was aiming to be some like underground megastar, which wasn't quite happening yet. <laughs> so I was like, oh, moving furniture about, bricks. Yeah, it's like beneath me kind of thing, yeah. And um, we were lugging stuff around all morning. And at a certain point, I mean, I was just moaning. I was just moaning, yeah? You know, you know those people that are constantly like, <sighs> yeah? Like, oh, but, uh, 
And, uh, and, and then she came in, the lady of the house, and she was like, oh, actually, can you move the wardrobe to the other part of the house? And he was like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, God, we just, we just moved it here. And he just turned to me like, vroomph, and just said, you know what? You're really depressing me. And just walked out. I was like, and no one ever talked to me like that. Just like a slap across the face, yeah? And it really shifted something in my character. I just thought, God, yeah, I can get into these negative moods where I'm just like, no. anyway, so that was very helpful, yeah? Um, another thing I'm very grateful to him for as well is like, just when I started coming along, I think probably around 2002, there was a whole kind of sex controversy thing within this order, which um, had just kind of blown up in the media. And I was very confused and I wouldn't say distressed, but I was a bit like, confused because I'd kind of fallen in love listening to all these tapes and I was just like it really uh, yeah it'd been a huge blossoming in my life and then there was all this sex scandal kind of um, sexual misconduct business and it was very helpful to walk have a walk and talk with him because he was there at the time yeah and it's not like he was trying to tell me not trying to convince me in any way but he just gave me context to the whole situation all the nuances uh, the headlines, da 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 da. And so I'm very grateful to him for that, actually, because a lot of people were very confused at that time. And um, it was an unpleasant atmosphere in the Buddhist Center, I have to say, yeah. So he, he, just, he just broadened the picture out for me without trying to convince me of anything. He'd had a hard time himself, frankly. So um, that was good. It seems to be a lot about him, but that's actually the way it was, yeah. So another good side to him, he was very much in touch with his kind of. I don't know, you could say it's feminine side. I don't mean that in a cheap way. I mean that like, not even feminine as in, divide, as in gender feminine, like male, female, just his, you know, like um, archetypally or something, yeah? He was quite, um, I don't know, receptive, fluid kind of, he had a kind of, and it gave him a sort of power. There's a sort of mystical thing to him as well, where he'd take things like archetypes and the imagination 100% seriously, yeah? which I found is a very good combination for me to have this dude who was kind of very much there, but also taking what we call the imagination and archetypes like 100% seriously, not as some kind of joke thing. Yeah? So, um, yeah, so he was a very important part. Okay, blah. So in, back in my own, where I was living, things were sort of coming to an end there, I would say. Yeah, two things happened. Um, well, two things happened. One was I, I went to, uh, I was, I keep, anyway, it was another gangster party, yeah? And it was near where I used to live. And this, it, was, it wasn't, uh, it was an expensive place, but it was more like a fortress, you know? It was like a couple of windows and typical business, yeah? Everything was white walls, white leather sofas, red lights, lots of strippers, lots of gangsters, the whole thing, yeah? And um, my friend there, who, who used to drive me to clubs, he was there, and he introduced me to another guy who was my age, so he was about 23, 24, and he said, oh yeah, this is my friend Nikolai, yeah, he's, he's Georgian, about me, I'm not actually, my dad's partially Georgian, but this, this guy was like, out of his head, yeah, and he said, yeah, yeah, I've done some work for the Georgians, honourable people, yeah, they pay in time. <laughs> and I was like, all right, nice. And then we sat outside, and he'd been taking a lot of ecstasy, so he was quite fluent, he was quite verbal about his life. And um, he was like a contract killer, yeah, he was like a, that's what he did for a job, he was like killing people for money on a regular basis, telling me like, oh yeah, never fight a guy with a gun, so you've got his leg blown out, and then da da da, and I was just like sitting there. And... It was very interesting because I've been kind of flirting with that life since I was about 10. Like a lot of my friends in, had been to jail or were in jail. And it was, for me, it was still a bit glamorous. Yeah, I'd seen people, all bad sort of things happen, but there was still glamour attached to it. Like you go to the club and there's some kind of, you know, you know, you've seen all those videos and films and all that stuff, yeah. The truth of it is like, it makes a fun story like now to tell it. It's like, ooh, exciting. Cause I'm assuming most of us are not hanging around with like, actual contract killers and stuff, I hope not. Anyway, but the reality of it is just, it was like being in an abattoir. It was like, um, just dead. It was, everything was numb and dead. And I thought, okay, that's the end of this, yeah. I think my contact with Buddhism had very much tuned me up as well. It was just like, no, this is, this is not the thing. I don't wanna be involved with these people anymore, actually. Um, yeah, so that was one thing. And I left that party and I don't think I saw any of those people again. 
Yeah, and I'd spent quite a lot of time with them, and I thought, nah, that's, that's done. The next, the other thing that was happening was um, that my friends upstairs, they started selling crack instead of weed. So the money goes up, and then the guns come in, and there's a whole escalation going on. And they start having problems with some other kid, kids in the area. They're like 16, 18, all had bulletproof vests, handguns. It's a bit like the wire, yeah? It's like, sounds exciting, but not that exciting. So there was all this thing happening. And I lived on the, I lived on the kind of ground floor, yeah, where you'd walk up these stairs and there'd be a window, and that was my window. And this kid, he'd, he'd knock on my window as if for me to get the guys upstairs. And I, I was in a bad mood, so I opened the door one day and I said to him, listen, I'm not the swear word bellboy, yeah? If you want to go and talk to him yourself. And then left. I think I probably went to the Buddha Center or went to somewhere like that. And I came back. And I got to my flat and the door was like kicked off the hinges, yeah? And my whole studio was in there. And I was like, oh no. So I went in, they hadn't touched my studio. What happened, there'd been a big fight upstairs. Some people had got stabbed and they came down and they just decided to kick my door off because I was some annoying teacher type figure or something. And my, my, my state of mind at that point was, I'm not leaving, yeah? Uh, I won't bore you with the rest of stuff, but I just thought, no. So I started training again, I was training all this I don't know, it's madness, like it's Israeli stuff, you know, where you knives and gun, blah, blah, blah. And I was just training for some showdown. I thought, no, I'm not leaving. Even though I wasn't that connected with them upstairs, yeah? It was like um, a point of pride and self-respect that I'm not going to get bullied out of my own place, yeah? So um, then I went to the doctors, yeah, for some reason, <laughs> a couple of days later, and I bumped into Kevla in the doctors, my, yeah, Kevla, my Buddhist friend. And I told him about what was going on, and he was completely cool again. He was just totally unfazed, like, all right, yeah. And he said, you know what, we've got a space in the men's community. Why don't you move in? <laughs> and uh, I was like, really? He's like, yeah, I said, that sounds great. And not, it was, I asked him afterwards if he was completely cool. I don't think he was, but he just, it was like skillful means, like, okay, let's get him out of this place. And... Um, I think he was just aware, in a very straightforward way, aware of some stubbornness in me, maybe some pride or something, and just made it possible for me to leave in a super smooth way. He came like more or less the next day with his car and just picked all my stuff up, not in a worried way. He didn't make me feel like I was running away or I was scared or anything. So, oh, this is nice. And, yeah. and so I moved into the men's community, which was called, is called Sarana, yeah? uh, which means refuge. And uh, it, was, it was really beautiful. It was like um, up on this hill, and there's a lovely park in front of it, huge house. There's like six, no, eight rooms, a shrine room. It was great. So um, I think my old friends started calling me Buddha man or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Buddha, uh, whatever. Weirdly enough, I think a lot of those sort of guys, they, they respect religion, whether it's Islam or Christianity or something. You know, and in jail a lot, there's like religion becomes quite a big thing. And so they were fine. Yeah, I was Buddha man now, there's no problem. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, so I was doing a lot of meditation. Well, what I thought was meditation. I was trying to meditate anyway, with my eyes closed for like ages, in the shrine room a lot. We cooked together, um, cleaning, and um, it was really good. And um, yeah, what did we do? Study, yeah, Kevla took study like super serious. Like at the end of a, a study course, we all had to do these presentations, like 20 minute uh, study presentation. He, would, he wasn't like, oh yeah, that was all right. It was like, hmm. Like, you'd really had to study, yeah? so that was really good. Um, there were some funny things at that time as well, though, because sometimes I'd be coming in drunk at, like, four in the morning after a club and, like, sneaking back into my room. And then, or I'd be, like, the worst bit was going to the butchers and, like, buying a load of turkey and ham and just hiding in the park and, like, stuffing it all in my mouth like an alcoholic, like... And then, like, coming and, like, chewing gum, you know, oh, yeah, like... So I wasn't quite, I wasn't that well integrated. Um, and I just met some really amazing people there, yeah? A guy called Sagravadra, he was from New Zealand. Um, very, very interesting person. Made this, made this uh, sculpture when I was there in the garden out of bronze resin, a Pranya Paramita, the female deity, well, goddess of wisdom. He made one, yeah, like a good one. Not a, like a, it was incredible. And yeah, he was an amazing guy, yeah, as well. Um, yeah, so just to be with these people that I feel, you know, there's a whole depth and clarity and door open into my life. Uh, and some kind of gravity as well, yeah, some kind of depth and 
not depth in a kind of nasty, deep, uh, heavy way, but depth as in actual, like connected with wisdom depth, yeah. Um, so I made a lot of friends, very good friends, uh, and that's continued. And I, but I, I was thinking yesterday, it made me a bit sad, I did actually lose quite a lot of friends as well. And I thought, well, there was no real, um, there was no real way around that. I, th I think, yeah, I had a good, well, yeah, I had a good friend of mine called Jamie. Wow, he had the hardest childhood, like, he was half Jamaican, half white. And in England, you get these interesting combinations of, like, for example, there's all sorts of different accents, but you'll get a black guy who talks, like, hardcore Cockney, like an East, East End guy, and then you'll get white dudes that talk in a Jamaican accent. It's a bit mixed up, yeah, but he was a hardcore Cockney, sort of, one of those guys, yeah. But he was so good to me, yeah, and... Um, yeah, he always, you know, he really looked out for me. And I have to say, like, there's something to it. He's like one of these people that's loyal. You know, he's like 100% loyal. No matter what would happen to me, I'm 100% sure he'd be there, like, guaranteed. I know that, yeah. So it's a bit bad, but I went to meet him. And I just couldn't take it anymore. Just the way he spoke about, especially about women, about, um, I mean, he'd been in jail lots, you know, firearms, all kinds of stuff. And he was a cook. He was a really, really good cook, like Michelin star cook. Like, he got himself out of the dirt into very high restaurants yeah, like really the best of the best in London. Uh, but it was a bit heartbreaking because I just thought, I can't be with this guy anymore, man. Just the way he was talking about people. Um, yeah, so you do lose people sometimes, you know. Um, and other times friendships, they just get gets a bit, you're on different tracks. Um, yeah, so anyway, I just thought about that. Yeah, I mean, really and truly, I don't even know. I just, my, the main thing that I was thinking was the, feel, the thing I feel like saying to people, and not in some evangelical hanging the Buddha around business, but it works, yeah? The path actually works, not just in the terms of becoming a better human being and more socially kind of competent and kind of confident and intelligent and educated and cultured and all this and grounded, but it works in the sense of it, op it does actually open doorways that sometimes it can take a while to get to. Um, like, uh, I have to say, that's why I feel like, um, you know, sometimes it's rough. Yeah, you get involved in Buddhism, you think, am I changing at all? No, this is a bit, I'm just like putting a nice, cre a nice topping on top of something. I'm generally unchanged. I'm still like this kind of unformed person with all these things. And this Buddhism's a nice social thing. <laughs> all this, yeah. Actually, no, it does work, yeah? Um, and it was very interesting. I thought, I've been doing this for 20 years now, and I feel like it, it's almost just now that things are starting to blossom, yeah? Which I would not have said to myself even a few years ago, yeah? It was like, it can be a grind sometimes, and sometimes that grind can last for years, yeah? I had a two-year period where it was just a grind out, yeah? It was just like forcing myself to meditate. But it works, yeah? So, um, again, I'm not trying to be evangelical, but I will... You know, I was talking to I was talking to a friend of mine who's been <laughs> don't worry. So I was talking to a friend of mine who's been doing this for a long time, yeah. And he just something shifted for him recently. Yeah, he's been doing this for much longer than me. And he said, I just feel like going around saying to people, stick with it. It works. Yeah, it actually does. So, you know, like I said, I never really wanted to be part of Buddhism as a group identity. I found it kind of off-putting. Yeah, it's, like I say, the polyester trousers and that, no dis. Anyway, polyester camping trousers and fleeces and crocs and like, I was like, this is not me, yeah. It's, this whole thing's not me. But <laughs> there's something, it almost happened against my will, yeah. There's, um, I don't know, there's something that lies in the heart of this thing which does transform your life and does make things seemingly impossible in terms of your own consciousness possible, yeah. Uh, and I would say a very important part of that, especially in this tradition, is what's called the Bodhisattva ideal. Yeah? Um, and actually the ordination in this particular order, sneakily, is actually a Bodhisattva ordination, which basically means you're not just practicing for yourself, you're quite literally practicing for other people. Yeah? You're, try, you're aiming to attain enlightenment through your own endeavors, but you're not just doing it for yourself. Yeah? And my experience of coming into contact with the Dharma was that meeting people that had absolutely no reason to make friends with me, no reason to look out for me, um, and they did. Many, many people that I haven't mentioned, yeah? Even people that I've forgotten about. When I really put it together, I'm like, wow, that's something. That's not just some kind of nonsense, religioso 
business. That's actually people that are trying to do something for other people. So um, that's all I really wanted to say. So thank you.